Noli Mi Tangere, Latin for Don't Touch Me, is a novel written by José Rizal, one of the national heroes of the Philippines, during the colonization of the country by Spain to describe perceived inequities of the Spanish Catholic priests and the ruling government. Originally written in Spanish, the book is more commonly published and read in the Philippines in either Tagalog or English. Together with its sequel, El Filibusterismo, the reading of Noli is obligatory for high school students throughout the country. The two novels are widely considered as the national epic of the Philippines and are performed in non-musical operas throughout the country. Title Rizal entitled this novel as such drawing inspiration from John chapter 20 verse 17 of the Bible, the technical name of a particularly painful type of cancer. Back in his time, it is unknown what is the modern name of said disease. He proposed to probe all the cancers of Filipino society that everyone else felt too painful to touch. Early English translations of the novel used titles like An Eagle Flight 1900 and The Social Cancer 1912, disregarding the symbolism of the title, but the more recent translations were published using the original Latin title. It has also been noted by the Austro-Hungarian writer Ferdinand Blumentritt that Noli mi tangere was a name used by ophthalmologists for cancer of the eyelids, that as an ophthalmologist himself Rizal was influenced by this fact is suggested in the novel's dedication. To my motherland. Background Jose Rizal, a Filipino nationalist and medical doctor, conceived the idea of writing a novel that would expose the ills of Philippine society after reading Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom. S. Cabin. He preferred that the prospective novel express the way Filipino culture was perceived to be backward, anti-progress, anti-intellectual, and not conducive to the ideals of the Age of Enlightenment. He was then a student of medicine in the Universidad Central de Madrid. In a reunion of Filipinos at the house of his friend Pedro A. Paterno in Madrid on 2 January 1884, Rizal proposed the writing of a novel about the Philippines written by a group of Filipinos. His proposal was unanimously approved by the Filipinos present at the time, among whom were Pedro, Maximino Viola and Antonio Paterno, Graciano López Jaina, Evaristo Aguirre, Eduardo Delete, Julio Urente and Valentin Ventura. However, this project did not materialize. The people who agreed to help Rizal with the novel did not write anything. Initially, the novel was planned to cover and describe all phases of Filipino life, but almost everybody wanted to write about women. Rizal even saw his companion spend more time gambling and flirting with Spanish women. Because of this, he pulled out of the plan of co-writing with others and decided to draft the novel alone. Plot Crisostomo Ibarra, the mestizo son of recently deceased Don Rafael Ibarra, is returning to San Diego in Laguna after seven years of study in Europe. Capitan Chiagu, a family friend, bids him to spend his first night in Manila where Chiagu hosts a reunion party at his riverside home on Anlog Street. Criso Stomo obliges. At dinner he encounters old friends, Manila High Society, and Padre Damaso, San Diego's old curate at the time Ibarra left for Europe. Damaso treats Criso Stomo with hostility, surprising the young man who took the friar to be a friend of his father. Crisostomo excuses himself early and is making his way back to his hotel when Lieutenant Guevara, another friend of his father, catches up with him. As the two of them walk to Crisostomo's stop, and away from the socialites at the party who may possibly compromise them if they heard, Guevara reveals to the young man the events leading up to Rafael's death and Damaso's role in it. Crisostomo, who has been grieving from the time he learned of his father's death, decides to forgive and not seek revenge. Guevara nevertheless warns the young man to be careful. The following day Criso Stomo returns to Capitan Tiago's home in order to meet with his childhood sweetheart, Tiago's daughter Maria Clara. The two flirt and reminisce in the Azodia, a porch overlooking the river. Maria reads back to Criso Stomo his farewell letter wherein he explained to her Rafael's wish for Criso Stomo to set out to study in order to become a more useful citizen of the country. Seeing Criso Stomo agitated at the mention of his father, however, Maria playfully excuses herself, promising to see him again at her family's San Diego home during the town fiesta. 
Crisostomo goes to the town cemetery upon reaching San Diego to visit his father's grave. However, he learns from the gravedigger that the town curate had ordered that Rafael's remains be exhumed and transferred to a Chinese cemetery. At this revelation, Crisostomo's anger explodes. But the gravedigger confesses that on the night he dug up the corpse, it was raining hard and he feared for his own soul, so defying the order of the priest, he instead threw the body into the lake. At that moment, Padre Bernardo Salva, the new curate of San Diego, walks into the cemetery. Crisostomo shoves him into the ground and demands an accounting, but Salva fearfully tells Crisostomo that the transfer was ordered by the previous curate, Padre Damaso. Crisostomo leaves in consternation. But Crisostomo, committed to his patriotic endeavors, is determined not to seek revenge and to put the matter behind him. As the days progress he carries out his plan to serve his country as his father wanted. He intends to use his family wealth to build a school, believing his paisanos would benefit from a more modern education than what is offered in the schools run by the government, whose curriculum was heavily tempered by the teachings of the friars. Enjoying massive support, and even by the Spanish authorities, Crisostomo's preparations for his school advance quickly in only a few days. He receives counsel from Don Anastasia, a revered local philosopher, who refers him to a progressive schoolmaster who lamented the friar's influence on public education and wished to introduce reforms. The building was planned to begin construction with the cornerstone to be laid in a ceremony during San Diego's town fiesta. One day, taking a break, Crisostomo, Maria, and their friends get on a boat and go on a picnic along the shores of the Laguna de Bay, away from the town center. It is then discovered that a crocodile had been lurking on the fish pens owned by the Ibarras. Elias, the boat's pilot, jumps into the water with a bolo knife drawn. Sensing Elias is in danger, Ibarra jumps in as well, and they subdue the animal together. Crisostomo mildly scolds the pilot for his rashness, while Elias proclaims himself in Crisostomo's debt. On the day of the fiesta, Elias warns Crisostomo of a plot to kill him at the cornerstone laying. The ceremony involved the massive stone being lowered into a trench by a wooden derrick. Crisostomo being the principal sponsor of the project is to lay the mortar using a trowel at the bottom of the trench. As he prepares to do so, however, the derrick fails and the stone falls into the trench, bringing the derrick down with it in a mighty crash. When the dust clears, a pale, dust-covered Crisostomo stands stiffly by the trench, having narrowly missed the stone. In his place beneath the stone is the would-be assassin. Elias has disappeared. The festivities continue at Crisostomo's insistence. Later that day, he hosts a luncheon to which Padre Damaso invites himself. Over the meal the old friar berates Crisostomo, his learning, his journeys, and the schoolbuilding project. The other guests hiss for discretion, but Damaso ignores them and continues in an even louder voice, insulting the memory of Raphael in front of Crisostomo. At the mention of his father, Crisostomo strikes the friar unconscious and holds a dinner knife to his neck. In an impassioned speech Crisostomo narrates to the astonished guests everything he heard from Lieutenant Guevara, who was an officer of the local police, about Damaso's schemes that resulted in the death of Rafael. As Crisostomo is about to stab Damaso, however, Maria Clara stays his arm and pleads for mercy. Crisostomo is excommunicated from the church, but has his excommunication lifted through the intercession of the sympathetic governor-general. However, upon his return to San Diego, Maria has turned sickly and refuses to see him. The new curate whom Crisostomo roughly accosted at the cemetery, Padre Bernardo Salva, is seen hovering around the house. Crisostomo then meets the inoffensive Liners, a peninsular Spaniard who, unlike Crisostomo, had been born in Spain. Chiagu presents Liners as Maria's new suitor. Sensing Crisostomo's influence with the government, Elias takes Crisostomo into confidence and one moonlit night, they secretly sail out into the lake. Elias tells him about a revolutionary group poised for open, violent clash with the government. This group has reached out to Elias in a bid for him to join them in their imminent uprising. Elias tells Crisostomo that he managed to delay the group's plans by offering to speak to Crisostomo first, that Crisostomo may use his influence to effect the reforms Elias and his group wish to see. 
In their conversation Elias narrates his family's history, how his grandfather in his youth worked as a bookkeeper in a Manila office but was accused of arson by the Spaniard owner when the office burned down. He was prosecuted and upon release was shunned by the community as a dangerous lawbreaker. His wife turned to prostitution to support the family but eventually they were driven into the hinterlands. Chrysostomo sympathizes with Elias but insists that he could do nothing, and that the only change he was capable of was through his schoolbuilding project. Rebuffed, Elias advises Chrysostomo to avoid any association with him in the future for his own safety. Heartbroken and desperately needing to speak to Maria, Chrysostomo turns his focus more towards his school. One evening, though, Elias returns with more information, a rogue uprising was planned for that same night, and the instigators had used Chrysostomo's name in vain to recruit malcontents. The authorities know of the uprising and are prepared to spring a trap on the rebels. In panic and ready to abandon his project, Chrysostomo enlists Elias in sorting out and destroying documents in his study that may implicate him. Elias obliges, but comes across a name familiar to him, Don Pedro Iberamendia. Chrysostomo tells him that Pedro was his great-grandfather, and that they had to shorten his long family name. Elias tells him Iberamendia was the same Spaniard who accused his grandfather of arson, and was thus the author of the misfortunes of Elias and his family. Frenzied, he raises his bolo to smite Chrysostomo, but regains his senses and leaves the house very upset. The uprising follows through, and many of the rebels are either captured or killed. They point to Chrysostomo as instructed and Chrysostomo is arrested. The following morning the instigators are found dead. It is revealed that Padre Salva ordered the senior sexton to kill them in order to prevent the chance of them confessing that he actually took part in the plot to frame Chrysostomo. Elias, meanwhile, sneaks back into the Ibarra mansion during the night and sorts through documents and valuables, then burns down the house. Some time later Capitan Chiagu hosts a dinner at his riverside house in Manila to celebrate Maria Clara's engagement with Liners. Present at the party were Padre Damaso, Padre Salva, Lieutenant Guevara, and other family friends. They were discussing the events that happened in San Diego and Chrysostomo's fate. Salva, who lusted after Maria Clara all along, says that he has requested to be transferred to the convent of the poor Clares in Manila under the pretense of recent events in San Diego being too great for him to bear. A despondent Guevara outlines how the court came to condemn Chrysostomo. In a signed letter he wrote to a certain woman before leaving for Europe, Chrysostomo spoke about his father, an alleged rebel who died in prison. Somehow this letter fell into the hands of an enemy, and Chrysostomo S. handwriting was imitated to create the bogus orders used to recruit the malcontents to the San Diego uprising. Guevara remarks that the penmanship on the orders was similar to Chrysostomo's penmanship seven years before, but not at the present day. And Chrysostomo had only to deny that the signature on the original letter was his, and the charge of sedition founded on those bogus letters would fail. But upon seeing the letter, which was the farewell letter he wrote to Maria Clara, Chrysostomo apparently lost the will to fight the charges and owned the letter as his. Guevara then approaches Maria, who had been listening to his explanation. Privately but sorrowfully, he congratulates her for her common sense in yielding Chrysostomo's farewell letter. Now, the old officer tells her, she can live a life of peace. Maria is devastated. Later that evening Chrysostomo, having escaped from prison with the help of Elias, climbs up the Azotea and confronts Maria in secret. Maria, distraught, does not deny giving up his farewell letter, but explains she did so only because Salva found Damaso's old letters in the San Diego Parsonage, letters from Maria's mother who was then pregnant with Maria. It turns out that Damaso was Maria's father. Salva promised not to divulge Damaso. S. Letters to the public in exchange for Chrysostomo's farewell letter. Chrysostomo forgives her, Maria swears her undying love, and they part with a kiss. Chrysostomo and Elias escape on Elias's boat. They slip unnoticed through the Estero de Bonando and into the Pasig River. Elias tells Chrysostomo that his treasures and documents are buried in the middle of the forest owned by the Ibarras in San Diego. Wishing to make restitution, Chrysostomo offers Elias the chance to escape with him to a foreign country, where they will live as brothers. 
Elias declines, stating that his fate is with the country he wishes to see reformed and liberated. Chrysostomo then tells him of his own desire for revenge and revolution, to lengths that even Elias was unwilling to go. Elias tries to reason with him, but sentries catch up with them at the mouth of the Pasig River and pursue them across Laguna de Bay. Elias orders Chrysostomo to lie down and to meet with him in a few days at the mausoleum of Chrysostomo's grandfather in San Diego, as he jumps into the water in an effort to distract the pursuers. Elias is shot several times. The following day news of the chase were in the newspapers. It is reported that Chrysostomo Ibarra, the fugitive, had been killed by sentries in pursuit. At the news Maria remorsefully demands of Damaso that her wedding with Linners be called off and that she be entered into the cloister, or the grave. Seeing her resolution, Damaso admits the true reason he ruined the Ibarra family and her relationship with Chrysostomo, because he was a mere mestizo and Damaso wanted Maria to be as happy as she could be, and that was possible only if she were to marry a full-blooded peninsular Spaniard. Maria would not hear of it and repeated her ultimatum, the cloister or the grave. Knowing fully why Salva had earlier requested to be assigned as chaplain in the convent of the poor Clares, Damaso pleads with Maria to reconsider, but to no avail. Weeping, Damaso consents, knowing the horrible fate that awaits his daughter within the convent but finding it more tolerable than her suicide. A few nights later in the forest of the Ibarras, a boy pursues his mother through the darkness. The woman went insane with the constant beating of her husband and the loss of her other son, an altar boy, in the hands of Padre Salva. Basilio, the boy, catches up with Sissa, his mother, inside the Ibarra mausoleum in the middle of the forest, but the strain had already been too great for Sissa. She dies in Basilio's embrace. Basilio weeps for his mother, but then looks up to see Elias staring at them. Elias was dying himself, having lost a lot of blood and having had no food or nourishment for several days as he made his way to the mausoleum. He instructs Basilio to burn their bodies and if no one comes, to dig inside the mausoleum. He will find treasure, which he is to use for his own education. As Basilio leaves to fetch the wood, Elias sinks to the ground and says that he will die without seeing the dawn of freedom for his people, and that those who see it must welcome it and not forget them that died in the darkness. In the epilogue, Padre Damaso is transferred to occupy a curacy in a remote town. Distraught, he is found dead a day later. Capitan Chiagu fell into depression and became addicted to opium and is forgotten by the town. Padre Salva, meanwhile, waits to be made a bishop. He is also the head priest of the convent where Maria Clara currently resides. Nothing is heard of Maria Clara, however, on a September night, during a typhoon, two patrolmen reported seeing a specter, implied to be Maria Clara, on the roof of the convent of the poor Clares moaning and weeping in despair. The next day, a representative of the authorities visited the convent to investigate last night's events and asked to inspect all the nuns. One of the nuns had a wet and torn gown and with tears told the representative of tales of horror, and begged for protection against the outrages of hypocrisy, which gives the implication that Padre Salva regularly rapes her when he is present. The abbess however, said that she was nothing more than a madwoman. A General J also attempted to investigate the nun's case, but by then the abbess prohibited visits to the convent. Nothing more was said again about Maria Clara. Publication history Rizal finished the novel in December 1886. At first, according to one of Rizal's biographers, Rizal feared the novel might not be printed, and that it would remain unread. He was struggling with financial constraints at the time and thought it would be hard to pursue printing the novel. Financial aid came from a friend named Maximo Viola, this helped him print the book at Berliner Buchdruckerei Aktiengesellschaft in Berlin. Rizal was initially hesitant, but Viola insisted and ended up lending Rizal 300 pesos for 2,000 copies. The printing was finished earlier than the estimated five months. Viola arrived in Berlin in December 1886, and by March 21, 1887, Rizal had sent a copy of the novel to his friend, Blumentritt. The book was banned by Spanish authorities in the Philippines, although copies were smuggled into the country. The first Philippine edition, and the second published edition, was finally printed in 1899 in Manila by Chaffer Y. Compania in Escolta. 
Recent English editions on August 21, 2007, a 480-page English-language version of Noli Me Tangere was released to major Australian bookstores. An Australian edition of the novel was published by Penguin Classics an imprint by Penguin Books to represent the company's commitment to publish the major literary classics of the world. American writer Harold Algenbraum, who first read Noli in 1992, translated the novel. A writer well acquainted with translating other Hispanophone literary works, Algenbraum proposed to translate the novel after being asked for his next assignment in the publishing company. Intrigued by the novel and knowing more about it, Penguin nixed their plan of adapting existing English versions and instead translated it on their own. Reaction and legacy this novel and its sequel, El Filibusterismo, nicknamed El Fili, were banned by Spanish authorities in the Philippines because of their allegations of corruption and abuse by the colonial government and the Catholic Church. Copies of the book were nevertheless smuggled in and hidden, and when Rizal returned to the Philippines after completing medical studies, he quickly ran afoul of the local government. A few days after his arrival, Rizal was summoned to Malacañan Palace by Governor General Emilio Torero, who told him of the charge that Noli Mi Tangere contained subversive elements. After a discussion, Torero was appeased but still unable to offer resistance to pressure from the church against the book. The persecution can be discerned from Rizal's letter to Light Merits. Rizal was exiled to Dapitan in Mindanao, then later arrested for inciting rebellion based largely on his writings. Rizal was executed by firing squad at the Luneta outside Manila's walls on December 30, 1896 at the age of 35, at the park that now bears his name. Influence on Filipino nationalism Rizal depicted nationality by emphasizing the positive qualities of Filipinos, the devotion of a Filipina and her influence on a man's life, the deep sense of gratitude, and the solid common sense of the Filipinos under the Spanish regime. The work was instrumental in creating a unified Filipino national identity and consciousness, as many natives previously identified with their respective regions. It lampooned, caricatured and exposed various elements in colonial society. Two characters in particular have become classics in Filipino culture, Maria Clara, who has become a personification of the ideal Filipino woman, loving and unwavering in her loyalty to her spouse, and the priest Father Damaso, who reflects the covert fathering of illegitimate children by members of the Spanish clergy. The book indirectly influenced the Philippine Revolution of Independence from the Spanish Empire, even though Rizal actually advocated direct representation to the Spanish government and an overall larger role for the Philippines within Spain's political affairs. In 1956, Congress passed Republic Act 1425, more popularly known as the Rizal Law, which requires all levels in Philippine schools to teach the novel as part of their curriculum. Noli Mi Tangere is being taught to third-year secondary school students, while its sequel El Filibusterismo is being taught for fourth-year secondary school students. The novels are incorporated to their study and survey of Philippine literature. Both of Rizal's novels were initially banned from Catholic educational institutions given its negative portrayal of the church, but this taboo has been largely superseded as religious schools conform to the Rizal law. Major characters Crisostomo Ibarra Juan Crisostomo Ibarra y Magdalene, commonly referred to the novel as Ibarra or Crisostomo, is the novel. S. protagonist, the mestizo, mixed race, son of Filipino businessman Don Rafael Ibarra, he studied in Europe for seven years. Ibarra is also Maria Clara's fiance. Maria Clara Maria Clara de los Santos y Alba, commonly referred to as Maria Clara, is Ibarra. S. fiancé and the most beautiful and widely celebrated girl in San Diego. She was raised by Capitan Chiago de los Santos, and his cousin, Isabel. In the later parts of the novel, she was revealed to be an illegitimate daughter of Father Damaso, the former curate of the town, and Doña Pia Alba, Capitan Chiago. 
S. wife, who had died giving birth to Maria Clara. At the novel's end, a heartbroken yet resolved Maria Clara entered the Beterio de Santa Clara a nunnery, after learning the truth of her parentage and mistakenly believing her lover Crisostomo to have been killed. In the epilogue, Rizal stated that it is unknown if Maria Clara is still living within the walls of the convent or she is already dead. Capitan Chiago Don Santiago de los Santos, known by his nickname Chiagu and political title Capitan Chiagu is it is said that Capitan Chiagu is the richest man in the region of Binondo and he possessed real properties in Pampanga and Laguna de Bay. He is also said to be a good Catholic, a friend of the Spanish government and thus was considered a Spaniard by the colonial elite. Capitan Chiagu never attended school, so he became the domestic helper of a Dominican friar who gave him an informal education. He later married Pia Alba from Santa Cruz. Padre Damaso Damaso Verdelagas, or Padre Damaso is a Franciscan friar and the former parish curate of San Diego. He is notorious for speaking with harsh words, high-handedness, and his cruelty during his ministry in the town. An enemy of Crisostomo. S. Father, Don Rafael Ibarra, Damaso is revealed to be Maria Clara. S. Biological father. Later, he and Maria Clara had bitter arguments whether she would marry Alfonso Liners de Espadaña, which he preferred, or to enter the nunnery, her desperate alternative. At the end of the novel, he is again reassigned to a distant town and later found dead in his bed. Elias Elias is Ibarra's mysterious friend and ally. Elias made his first appearance as a pilot during a picnic of Ibarra and Maria Clara and her friends. The 50th chapter of the novel explores the past of Elias and history of his family. About 60 years before the events of Noli Mi Tangere, Elias's grandfather Inkong in his youth worked as a bookkeeper in a Manila office. One night the office burned down, and Don Pedro Ibaramendia, the Spaniard owner, accused him of arson. Ng Kong was prosecuted and upon release was shunned by the community as a dangerous lawbreaker. His wife and Pong turned to prostitution to support themselves but eventually they were driven into the hinterlands. Their and Pong bore her first son, Balat. Driven to depression, Ng Kong hangs himself deep in the forest. Mpong was sickly for lack of nourishment in the forest and was not strong enough to cut down his corpse and bury him, and Balat was then still very young. The stench led to their discovery, and Mpong was accused of killing her husband. She and her son fled to another province where she bore another son. Balat grew up to be a bandit. Eventually Balat's legend grew, but so did the efforts to capture him, and when he finally fell he was cut limb by limb and his head was deposited in front of Mpong's house. Seeing the head of her son, Mpong died of shock. Mpong's younger son, knowing their deaths would somehow be imputed upon him, fled to the province of Tayabas where he met and fell in love with a rich young heiress. They have an affair and the lady got pregnant. But before they could marry, his records were dug up. Then the father, who disapproved of him from the start, had him imprisoned. The lady gave birth to Elias and his twin sister but died while they were children. Elias and his sister were well cared for, with Elias even going to Ateneo and his sister going to La Concordia, but as they wanted to become farmers they eventually returned to Tayabas. He and his sister grew up not knowing about their father, being told that their father had long died. Elias grew up to be a young abusive brat who took particular joy in berating an elderly servant who, nevertheless, always submitted to his whims. His sister was more refined and eventually was betrothed to a fine young man. But before they could marry, Elias ran afoul with a distant relative. The relative struck back by telling him about his true parentage. The verbal scuffle mounted to the point where records were dug up, and Elias and his sister, as well as a good part of town, learned the truth. The elderly servant who Elias frequently abused was their father. The scandal caused the engagement of Elias' sister to break off. Depressed, the girl disappeared one day and was eventually found dead along the shore of the lake. Elias himself lost face before his relatives and became a wanderer from province to province. 
Like his uncle Balat, he became a fugitive and his legend grew, but by degrees he became the gentler, more reserved, and more noble character first introduced in the novel. Peloso Potasio Filosofo Tasio, known by his tagalized name Peloso Potasio. Tasio was enrolled in a philosophy course and was a talented student, but his mother was a rich but superstitious matron. Like many Filipino Catholics under the sway of the friars, she believed that too much learning condemned souls to hell. She then made Tasio choose between leaving college or becoming a priest. Since he was in love, he left college and married. Tasio lost his wife and mother within a year. Seeking consolation and in order to free himself from the cockpit and the dangers of idleness, he took up his studies once more. But he became so addicted to his studies and the purchase of books that he entirely neglected his fortune and gradually ruined himself. Persons of culture called him Don Anastasia, or Peloso Potasio, while the great crowd of the ignorant knew him as Tasio el Loco on account of his peculiar ideas and his eccentric manner of dealing with others. Seeking for reforms from the government, he expresses his ideals in paper written in a cryptographic alphabet similar from hieroglyphs and Coptic figures hoping that the future generations may be able to decipher it. Doña Victorina Doña Victorina de los Reyes de Espadaña, commonly known as Doña Victorina, is an ambitious Filipina who classifies herself as a Spanish and mimics Spanish ladies by putting on heavy makeup. The novel narrates Doña Victorina's younger days, she had lots of admirers, but she spurned them all because none of them were Spaniards. Later on, she met and married Don Tiburcio de Espadaña, an official of the Customs Bureau ten years her junior. However, their marriage is childless. Her husband assumes the title of medical doctor, even though he never attended medical school, using fake documents and certificates, Tiburcio illegally practices medicine. Tiburcio's usage of the title doctor consequently makes Victorina assume the title draw, doctora, female doctor. Apparently, she uses the whole name Doña Victorina de los Reyes de de Espadaña, with double de to emphasize her marriage surname. She seems to feel that this awkward titling makes her more sophisticated. Sisa, Crispin, and Basilio Sisa, Crispin, and Basilio represent a Filipino family persecuted by the Spanish authorities. Narcissa or Sisa is the deranged mother of Basilio and Crispin. Described as beautiful and young, although she loves her children very much, she cannot protect them from the beatings of her husband, Pedro. Crispin is Sisa's seven-year-old son. An altar boy, he was unjustly accused of stealing money from the church. After failing to force Crispin to return the money he allegedly stole, Father Salva and the head sacristan killed him. It is not directly stated that he was killed, but a dream of Basilio. S. suggests that Crispin died during his encounter with Padre Salva and his minion. Basilio is Sisa's ten-year-old son. An acolyte tasked to ring the church's bells for the Angelus, he faced the dread of losing his younger brother and the descent of his mother into insanity. At the end of the novel, a dying Elias requested Basilio to cremate him and Sisa in the woods in exchange for a chest of gold located nearby. He will later play a major role in El Filibusterismo. Due to their tragic but endearing story, these characters are often parodied in modern Filipino popular culture. Salome is Elias' sweetheart. She lived in a little house by the lake, and though Elias would like to marry her, he tells her that it would do her or their children no good to be related to a fugitive like himself. In the original publication of Noli, the chapter that explores the identity of Elias and Salome was omitted, classifying her as a total non-existing character. This chapter, entitled Elias y Salome was probably the 25th chapter of the novel. However, recent editions and translations of Noli provides the inclusion of this chapter, either on the appendix or renamed as Chapter 10 X. Other characters there are a number of secondary and minor characters in Noli Mi Tangere. Items indicated inside the parenthesis are the standard Filipinization of the Spanish names in the novel. 
Padre Hernando de la Siba, a Dominican friar. He is described as short and has fair skin. He is instructed by an old priest in his order to watch Crisostomo Ibarra. Padre Bernardo Salva the successor of Padre Damaso as the Franciscan curate of San Diego, and who secretly lusts after Maria Clara. He is described to be very thin and sickly. It is also hinted that his surname, Salva, is the shorter form of Salva, Salvation, or Salva, is short for Salvaje, Savage, Wild. Hinting at the fact that he is willing to kill an innocent child, Crispin, who he accused of stealing money worth two onzas. El Alferez, Alpers, the unnamed chief of the local Guardia Civil and husband of Doña Consolación. He is the sworn enemy of the priests in the town's power struggle. Doña Consolación, wife of the Alferez, nicknamed as La Musa de las Guardias Civiles, the Muse of the Civil Guard or La Alfereza. She was a former laundrywoman who passes herself as a peninsular, and is best remembered for her abusive treatment of Sisa. Don Tibercio de Espadaña, a Spanish quack doctor who is weak and submissive to his pretentious wife, Doña Victorina. Tenyant Guevara, a close friend of Don Rafael Ibarra. He reveals to Criso Stomo how Don Rafael Ibarra's death came about. Alfonso Liners, a distant nephew of Tibercio de Espadaña, the would-be fiancé of Maria Clara. Although he presented himself as a practitioner of law, it was later revealed that he is, like Don Tibercio, a fraud. He later died from medications Don Tibercio had given him. Tia Isabel, Capitan Tiago's cousin, who helped raise Maria Clara and served as a surrogate mother figure. Governor General, Governor General, unnamed in the novel, he is the most powerful colonial official in the Philippines. He harbors great disdain for the friars and corrupt officials, and sympathizes with Ibarra. Don Filippo Lino, vice mayor of the town of San Diego, leader of the liberals. Padre Manuel Martin, he is the linguist curate of a nearby town who delivers the sermon during San Diego's fiesta. Don Rafael Ibarra, the deceased father of Crisostomo Ibarra. Though he was the richest man in San Diego, he was also the most virtuous and generous. Doña Pia Alba, wife of Capitan Chiagu and mother of Maria Clara, she had died giving birth to her daughter. In reality, she was raped by Padre Damaso. Don Pedro Ibaramendia, Crisostomo Ibarra. S. Basque great-grandfather who falsely accused Elias's grandfather and ruined his family. The surname was later shortened to Ibarra, hence Elias does not realize the relationship at first. Albino, a seminarian who follows Crisostomo Ibarra in a picnic with Maria Clara's friends. Gobernator Gigantoka, General de Paz, Gobernator General Pujolt. Translations Many English and Tagalog translations have been made of Noli Mi Tangere, as well as a few other languages. The copyrights of the original text have expired, and the copyrights of some translators have also expired, so certain translations are in the public domain and have been put online by Project Gutenberg. English Friars and Filipinos 1900, by Frank Ernest Gannett. Available freely via Project Gutenberg. The Social Cancer 1912, by Charles Derbyshire. Available freely via Project Gutenberg. Noli Mi Tangere, a complete English translation of Noli Mi Tangere from the Spanish of Dr. José Rizal, 1956, by Senator Camilo Osias. The Lost Eden, 1961, by Leon Ma. Guerrero. Noli Mi Tangere, 1997, by Maria Soledad Loxin. Noli Mi Tangere, 2006, by Harold Algenbraum. Published by Penguin Classics. Noli Mi Tangere, a shortened version in modern English with an introduction and notes 2016, by Nicholas Tamblin. Tagalog Noli Mi Tangere, also titled Huiga Kong Salangan Nino Man, Nobody Dare Touch Me, 1906, by Dr. Pascual H. Poblete. Available freely via Project Gutenberg. Noli Mi Tangere, 1997, by Virgilio Almario. Noli Mi Tangere, 1999, by Ophelia Jamilo Sasilapan, Tagalog translation of the English translation by Leon Ma. 
Guerrero. Other Languages au Pays de Moines, in the Land of Monks, 1899, French by Henri Lucas and Ramon Sempa. Available freely via Project Gutenberg. Ni touche pas, don't touch it, 1980, French translation by Yavita Ventura Castro, Collection UNESCO, Connaissance de l'Orient, Gallimard, Paris. Noli mi tangere, 1987, German, by Anne-Marie del Cueto Mort. Published by Insel Verlag. Noli mi tangere, 2003, Italian, by Vasco Caney. Published by Debit Editore, Livorno, Italy, ISBN 88-86705-26-3. Noli mi tangere, Philippinch Roman, Noli mi tangere, Filipino novel, 1912, Dutch, by Abraham Anthony Fokker, published by Sorabijosh Handelsblad. Available freely via Project Gutenberg. Adaptations The Noli has been adapted for literature, theater, television, and film. 1915, Noli mi tangere, a silent film adaptation by Edward M. Gross, 1930, Noli mi tangere, another silent film adaptation, directed by José Nepomuceno under Malayan movies, 1951, national artist for cinema Gerardo de Leon directed a motion picture titled Sisa, starring Anita Linda in the role of the titular character, 1957, Noli mi tangere, the opera, an opera in Filipino, Tagalog, composed by national artist for music Felipe Padilla. Dilla de Leon with libretto by national artist for visual arts Guillermo Tolentino. World premiere in 1957 at Far Eastern University Auditorium. Staged in 1974 at Cultural Center of the Philippines, CCP, Main Theater. Staged in 1987 by Fides Cayagan Asensio's Music Theater Foundation at the CCP. Staged in 2011, November, and 2012, July to August, by Dulang Universidad ng Pilipinas at Guerrero Theater, University of the Philippines. Staged in 2013, one night only, by Far Eastern University as part of its 85th anniversary at Far Eastern University Auditorium. Staged in 2014, produced by J&S Productions at Newport Performing Arts Theater, Resorts World Manila. Staged in 2017, produced by J&S Productions at Tangalang Nicanor Abelardo, CCP, International Stagings, in 1988, Music Theater Foundation's 1987 production was toured in the USA with reduced performers in 1988 in Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis and Los Angeles. The first documented staging by a local group in the USA was in 2012, produced by KGB Productions and staged by Da Cornetto Opera Company at Harris Theater for Music and Dance, Chicago, performed in Filipino with English supertitles. Staged in 2013 in New York, produced by Edwin Hosue at the Sylvia and Danny K. Playhouse, Hunter College. Staged in 2014 in Washington, D.C., produced by Edwin Hosue at Eisenhower Theater, Kennedy Center. Staged in 2016 in Richmond, Virginia, produced by Capital Opera Richmond at Henrico Theater. To be staged in June 2017 in Boston, produced by KGB Productions and staged by Opera Britannica, venue TBA. 1961, Noli mi tangere, a faithful film adaptation of the novel, was directed by Gerardo de Leon for Bayanihan Arriba Productions, featuring Eddie Del Mar in the role of Crisostomo Ibarra. Released for the birth centenary of José Rizal, the motion picture was awarded the best picture in the 10th Famous Awards. 1979, Kanzer, Noli mi tangere, play in Filipino, Tagalog, written by Jamar Flares. World premiere in 1979 at Cultural Center of the Philippines by theater group Bulwagang Gantampala. It has been staged annually by Gantampala Theater, the group's new name, since 1989. In 2015, it was adapted into a sung-through musical by Gantampala Theater with music composed by Jode Balsamo. 1992, Noli mi tangere, a 13-episode TV series by Eddie S. Romero. This adaptation features Joel Torre in the role of Crisostomo Ibarra, Chin Chin Gutierrez as Maria Clara, and Techi Agbayani as Sisa. 1995, Noli Mi Tangere, a Filipino Tagalog musical adaptation of the novel staged by theater company Tangalang Filipino with libretto, book and lyrics by national artist for literature Bienvenido Lumbra and music by Ryan Kayabyab. It premiered in 1995 at the Cultural Center of the Philippines, directed by Nanan Padilla. It went on to tour Japan. 
It starred John Arcia and Adi Jamora alternating as Crisostomo Ibarra, Monique Wilson as Maria Clara, and Regine Velasquez as Sisa. Bernardo Bernardo and Baji Pascua alternated as Padre Damaso, and Nanette Inventor and Sheila Francisco as Dona Victorina. It was restaged in 2005, directed by Paul Morales, and in 2011, directed by Adi Jamora. In 2014, it was staged in Los Angeles, directed by Olga Natividad. Several excerpts from Noli Mi Tangere were dramatized in the 1998 film José Rizal, with Joel Torre as Criso Stomo Ibarra and Monique Wilson as Maria Clara. 1998, Sissa, a remake of the 1951 film of the same name. Written and directed by Mario O'Hara. 2005, Noli Mi Tangere II, a modern literary adaptation of the novel written by Roger Olivares. 2008-2009, Noli at Philly, Dakota 2000, a stage adaptation of Noli Mi Tangere and El Filibusterismo by the Philippine Educational Theater Association, set in the present day, in the fictional town of Maypaho in the province of San Lorenzo. Written by Nicanor G. Tiongson and directed by Soxi Tapasio. In popular culture a series of streets in the Sampaloc area of Manila are named after the characters Ibarra, Sisa and Basilio. A street in Makati City is named Ibarra Street, located between Matanzas and Guernica Streets. A restaurant serving Filipino cuisine at Greenbelt in Makati is called Restaurante Pia y Damaso, after Maria Clara's biological parents. A restaurant chain called Criso Stomo features dishes from Filipino history and culture such as Achara ni Ibarra. Its sister restaurant is called Elias. See also El Filibusterismo MGA Ibong Mandaragat References External links Original text in Spanish, complete novel Book Notes, Summary in Tagalog, Noli Mi Tangere Book Notes, Summary in English, The Social Cancer Complete English Version, The Social Cancer Full Text English Translation Complete text, HTML, images, OCR, in Spanish. Charles Derbyshire English translation. Pascual Poblete Tagalog translation. Noli Mi Tangere public domain audiobook at LibriVox. Noli Mi Tangere, deciphered in Filipino. Rizal's Little Odyssey. Noli Mitangere 13 episode television series from the Cultural Center of the Philippines Kanyat Kayo Fan Language, an article by Ambeth R. Ocampo regarding romantic practices and sensual undertones which can be found in the unabridged version of Noli Mitangere, from his Looking Back column on the pages of the Philippine Daily Inquirer on February 2, 2005, page 13, News, Google. Com. Au pair de José Rizal, Versione Italiana di Vasco Caney.